Yeah, I, um, I don't think everyone knows what an amazing educator you are as a teacher, as a principal, um, but as a parent, that's a big dream and inspiration that you're supporting. How are you going to support Malala in the future of getting education for all? Uh, thank you very much. I often tell one thing that uh, I only did one thing as a father and that is that I accepted her as an individual, free individual and in most parts of the world when a girl is born so right from the very beginning her wings are clipped. Mm. She's not let to fly. The only thing I did, I tried to make her free, to make her free and independent. And I, I dream for, him, for, for her. I mean, all that is good. Now, it's up to her what she chooses for herself. I think we all agree you did a really good job not clipping Malala's <laughs> wings, right? So, um... I'm a big believer in girl power and girlfriends, and uh, Shiza came into your life, I think, in a very special way. Tell us how you met, Shiza. Sure. I met Malala when she was nine years old, um, and she had already started speaking out. I had grown up in Pakistan and worked a lot on girls' rights, social justice, and then I went abroad to college. I was in the U.S., and I heard about Malala's story. She was blogging on the BBC and speaking out about her right and the right of girls like her to go to school. And she lived only a couple of hours from my own hometown, the capital city of, of Pakistan, Islamabad. And this was a story that nobody knew at the time. Nobody was speaking about what was going on in the Swat Valley apart from Malala and her father. So I found out about the political climate there through her and through what she was doing and felt just a great deal of accountability to her, to the story, and to the girls of that region. So I reached out and said, how can we help? How can we help get out this story? How can we help protect you? And how can we help get out this, get, get this right back for you? Um, and that began a relationship that had many steps, one of which was a summer camp that, that we had together in 2009, and then many things that followed. Um, but really, I stepped in hoping to amplify her voice and the voice of girls like her, and I'm so proud of, of where she is today. And what I think a lot of people don't know is uh, you were working for McKinsey when you heard the news that Malala was shot, and you dropped everything and came to support the family, and now, congratulations, you are CEO of, as of today, the Malala Fund. Second. That's right. So we're very excited about that. And I think we wanted to uh, thank McKinsey for loaning you, and I hope a lot more companies do that whenever an executive can be supportive of, a, of an incident or an opportunity. So Malala, 30 minutes ago, was your first tweet. <laughs> <laughs> what was your first tweet? Uh, simply, I told people, tweet. <laughs> yeah, please tweet. <laughs> um, my first tweet was that, thank you so much, all of you, and um, I want to listen from you and ask me any question, and I would love to answer you. And as well as then, I found so many questions were coming, and people asked me who uh, inspired you and why you continue uh, your campaign for education, why is education so important, and I tried to answer all of them. And I'll try to continue <laughs> It and I hope that people will support me and people will follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, and as well as they will visit, our, uh, visit the website of uh, Malala Fund as well. So Shiza, what, what is the Facebook? Because we want to continue this conversation. So it's Malala Fund on Facebook and mm -hmm. on Twitter, and the website is malalafund.org. We've just launched everything, so we're hoping to have everyone join the conversation. Um, like I said, Malala started off as a blogger. That's how she told the world what was happening in the Swat Valley. So it was very special to have a return to the internet. We want to use that as effectively as possible to mobilize supporters, to mobilize the thousands of individuals who stood up after Malala's shooting and said, I am Malala, I support you. 
you know, a year in with Malala healthy and back to school, we're ready to take on this mission. We're looking to have supporters who have supported Malala so far join us actively. So Zia, you and Malala have both said that extremists are afraid of books and pens. Mm. Is that true? Uh, yes, of course. <clears throat> the answer is very simple. Uh, a thief loves night's darkness when he wants to steal something. And the thugs, the terrorists, they love ignorant societies because education is light, ignorance is darkness. It's very easy for someone to make a stray in the darkness. And when there is light, you can't make people, you can't make them astray. Mm -hmm. You can't miss the right path. And uh, for the extremists, terrorists, the best favorable thing is darkness, ignorant societies because if these boys and the girls if they don't have bags on their back school bags on their back and if the society is ignorant then it is very easy for them to give them suicide jackets so this is their agenda and uh, that's why they are against books pens and everything that stands for civilization and culture. So Malala, understanding that, what, is, what do you hope the Malala Fund will achieve? Uh, my dream is to see every girl to be educated in every country, and especially in countries like Syria nowadays, we can see that uh, people are homeless and children are out of their schools. And so that's why we organize Malala Fund. And it's for those children who are suffering the most and for those countries where there is terrorism, where children are suffering from child labor, such as in India, we can take an example. Uh, if you look at Pakistan, uh, girls are suffering from sexual violence as well so there are so many problems countless problems so we said that we need a solution for this and we need to do something for it so that's why we organize Malala fund and it will help in advocacy as well it will build uh, it would build schools it would train teachers it would do uh, uh, seminars to motivate parents to motivate children to go and uh, get education and in advocacy we also try to tell people how important education is and how can it enlighten the future of their children. Well, I, you had a quote uh, at the UN on your birthday. You said that the only thing being shot has changed in you is that weakness, fear, and hopelessness died. And I, I think we can all agree that you're right. So Shiza, you have a big job. I mean, that's, that's not a small dream to just wake up and say we're going to educate every girl in the world. What are some of your thoughts on the partnerships you might have or the activities you're going to do moving forward? It's a tremendous task, um, but we're approaching it with a lot of passion, commitment, and the right skills um, and capabilities. We believe very much that solutions to education have to be rooted in local culture. So we hope to work with innovators, entrepreneurs, advocates, activists on the ground and help them develop solutions that put girls back in school. We believe that education isn't simply about literacy, but it's about giving girls back their power, their ability to be decision makers, live a more fulfilled life, and be agents of positive change in their community. We see the fund as not just allowing girls to live better lives, but truly helping humanity move forward in terms of unleashing the potential of girls across the world. Um, and so that's the direction that we're headed in. And, and really, we hope to create more Malalas, more young girls who have their voice and the ability to create change. So, Malala, what do your brothers think about all of this? Are they, are they just running loose in New York City right now? Um, I would like to share a story. Okay. Uh, one day, uh, I was just sitting with my youngest brother. He's nine. His name is Atal. And he was just looking at me, uh, just 
three, four months ago and he said, Malala, I said, yes, he said, I can't understand why you are getting awards and why people say you are Malala. What have you done? <laughs> <laughs> it was quite like, he, I just was stunned. I said, what can I tell him? How can I answer him? So, <laughs> they, they're quite nice to me, but it's... <laughs> But if I talk like really naturally and if I tell the truth, they're still naughty and they're they, still naughty. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Brothers they, are always brothers. <laughs> Malala's little brother had what three orders of French fries at lunch yesterday. It was unbelievable. <laughs> um, Zia, I, I, I have such respect that. Um, you stood up when, even before Malala had a strong voice, you had a voice for girls' education as an educator, and um, that must have been quite difficult. But are you seeing, thanks to a lot of the people in this room, that, that change, that there is hopefully a momentum towards more girls getting educated? Yeah, of course, uh, I see I'm very hopeful, very optimistic that a change is coming and here in america in european countries education is taken for granted uh, i think in many countries uh, underdeveloped and poor countries uh, to get education it's just a dream so a change is coming in those countries mm -hmm. and it's the responsibility of the rich states rich people all around the world to think about the children who are without books, without pens, without clean water, without so many basic human rights. Mm -hmm. But we are hopeful. A change is coming. A change in mindset is coming. A change in thinking is coming. And if we think dif differently, it makes a big difference. I agree. So. Mm. Shiza, how can all these people help you all? You have a big goal, but um, do you want them to all go to Twitter right now and follow the conversation? Can we donate? How can we be helpful to everything you're trying to accomplish? There's multiple ways to get involved now, and we're building that up. We hope to have everyone who's, ex who's expressed support for Malala for her campaign <clears throat> join. Right now we have our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, if you want to be part of the conversation and share your ideas and why this is important to you. Um, we have our donation portal up, um, and we're going to continue to find new ways to engage. We have Malala's story um, being revealed in her book, which comes out in two weeks, and I know that all of you um, who read it will find it very inspiring and very insightful in terms of what it means to be a girl in, in many parts of the world. Um, and we'll continue to come up with new platforms to engage the energy that, that exists around this issue. So in closing, Malala, you said that um, if there was a gun in your hand and the Talib who shot you was standing right in front of you, well, you would not shoot him. That you have learned forgiveness from your mother and your father, from Mohammed and Mandela. So tell us all, because I think you're one of the wisest people I've ever met. <laughs> what is your advice to all of us right now in this moment? When I said that I would not shoot that Talib because if I shoot him, or if I take a revenge from him through cruel ways, then there would be no difference between me and a Talib. There's a difference between, between a peaceful person and between a Talib. A Talib chooses guns to solve a problem, and we choose our voice, we choose dialogue, and we choose all peaceful way to find a solution for problems. And the other thing is that I learn every day from every person. I'm learning from you, I'm learning from my father, I'm learning from Shiza, I'm learning from all of you who are listening to me now, who are looking at me now. And every day I learn something. And I have learned from Muhammad, peace be upon him. He was a great prophet. I have learned tolerance from him. I have learned uh, about passions. And then uh, people like Martin Luther King Jr., he was a great man. And at that time when he was saying that I have a dream, he didn't know that tomorrow his dream will come true. And he did it. And I believe that today it would seem like a dream that we are saying tomorrow there would be equality, we want change and we want girls to be educated. It's, it seems a dream now, but in future it would be reality. And I'm hoping that 
inshallah very soon our dreams uh, will soon be the reality and we would see every girl to be educated and we would see uh, peace all over the world and i think you all are my inspiration mm -hmm. inshallah well thank you malala Sen does know that education is not a cure-all. Uh, women's education, again, I'm quoting him, which has been a powerful force in reducing mortality discrimination against women, um, has not been able to eliminate, uh, he notes, natality discrimination. We'll come back to this in a little bit. But um, uh, in a 2013 essay, which you've been assigned this, uh, for this week, Sen notes that despite other changes in incentive structures, um, uh, it seems from the demographics that many families are choosing to abort female fetuses at much higher rates than they abort male fetuses. And as long as that happens, you have this kind of deep and quiet violence, uh, which skews the population of the world because of prejudice against women. So I'm here uh, with the co-founders of Shining Hope for Communities, uh, uh, Kennedy Odede and Jessica Posner, uh, who are Wesleyan alumni, who I, I had, had the pleasure to get to know when they were students, and uh, they're talking to us from uh, uh, Kenya, and uh, where they are uh, busy at work on a number of projects that we'll be talking uh, about this morning. Uh, we're in uh, towards the end of our class, How to Change the World, and this week our focus is on uh, women, uh, education, and social change. And uh, Shafco is such a successful and vibrant organization that I, I thought it would be very interesting for our students to hear from you about what what was the motivation about starting your uh, or, uh, organization and, and uh, how did it get started? So Shafco started out of anger. So there's two things when you want to do something, you feel it that well, I feel a lot of injustice in my life. I felt that being poor in the community made you that you have no future. You know, there is there was no hope. So hope is a big thing here. So there was no hope. And every avenue that I looked to was blocked. You know, there's no other way. So what happened, I also get inspired by other people. One of them is Martin Luther King Jr. I remember reading the story of Martin Luther King Jr. how he started the movement. You know what I mean? And what I've learned is that these things they start, first of all, by the passion. My passion was to see something is happening. And then another thing is happening that when you want to do something, you also feel a lot of difficulties that will never work. You can't do it, you know what I mean? Until you try. For example, Shoko, I tried with soccer ball that I bought with 20 cents, you know what I mean? And that's how the movement started. And I told people this was, this was like a movement. This is an agency, you know? It was, this is a time. We cannot keep waiting. Right. There is no right. money. You know what I mean? And we started coming together to discuss our issues, and a movement was formed. So what do we learn from that? One, anger. Anger can be expressed in two ways. One is by joining the gang. Take the gang, the gang, go out. Second is you can also use it in how to bring the change. So my anger was that I was frustrated online. I felt horrible. You know what I mean? So I used that, I challenge it into passion. My passion was to see community coming together, discussing our issues, and believing that change comes from within, you know? So I think the first thing is the passion. And then after having the passion, because you feel it in your heart that this is going to work, then how do you express that thing to other people? How do you make them believe in your mission? Yes. You know, that's the most difficult part. You know And it was, for me, they called me mayor in Kibera. But this started by involving more people. For example, I make, I make the mission so simple. Everybody loves their mom, their mother, for example. But when you talk about women in the community, it is vague, so vague. Nobody cares, you know what I mean? And I say, guys, listen, what happened to my sister? You know, it should happen to your sister too. Look how much our, part, our moms have been struggling to feed us in this community. You know, we are starting a movement to protect them. So what I'm next is that, oh, I already made this thing to be what? Personalized. 
Whereby these people are not feeling like, oh my God, it's personal, right? Eh? It's my mom. You mean? So we are going to fight for our mom's right. We are going to protect them. You mean? So I stay away from women. <laughs> but the women is a big picture. But my goal is the white women in my community. But I'm using this group of people, even the strongest men in the community, to remind them about their moms, their mothers. And that's how the movement started. So I already convinced them. Jessica, how did you first get introduced to the conditions in Kibera and, and this focus, this kind of personal focus on my sister or my, one's mother? How, how, did, how were you introduced to this? So I was a junior at Wesley University and I studied abroad in Nairobi for my junior semester abroad. And somehow, just I guess by chance or luck, got introduced to Kennedy mm -hmm. and ended up living with him and his family in Kibera and seeing, you know, this or very grassroots organization kind of movement. It wasn't really an organization. It was sort of young people just coming together, talking about issues. And so I got involved, I guess, in 2007 from that perspective, just as a student abroad, sort of volunteering with Kennedy, getting to know his world and his family. And then when I came back um, to Wesleyan, I was convinced that, you know, somebody like Kennedy should be at a place like Wesleyan. So with some help from other people and really through Wesleyan's um, out-of-the-box thinking, that really happened. Right, and so, I mean, but I think that, you know, we also thought that was maybe unrealistic because before Wesleyan, um, Kennedy didn't really have a formal education. But I think that at Wesleyan, when Kennedy came, I was a senior and Kennedy was a freshman. And we had always talked about this organization and what it was doing, this sort of movement, what it was doing now, um, and then sort of the potential. And Kennedy had always said his dream was to start a school for girls. So one day I saw this like advertisement called 100 Projects for Peace. And I said, well, why don't we apply? Like, we could build your school for girls. And at that point, you know, I was 21 and you're older, but I was probably very <laughs> unrealistic. And I was like, yeah, if it wasn't, you were 22, you weren't that old. Um, and, <laughs> and I think that we sort of, it wasn't really a plan to start an organization. We didn't think of it that yeah. way. It's like, let's, let's do what we have to do. Let's get whatever money we can you know, get and start a school. And I don't really think at that point there was a plan beyond that. Could you say a little bit about a school for girls? Um, and, and Kennedy already started to talk about appealing to people through their, this is your sister, this is your mom. But um, what, what effects do you see happening because you are giving young, young girls a chance for primary education? What, what effects does that have? Yeah, so I think the sort of idea was that, so what our model is, is it's a school for girls. That's how it sort of, before that it was youth and kind of community. But the first concrete thing we did was we built a school for girls. And the idea was connect a school for girls to social services that are open to the whole community. And so people are using healthcare and economic empowerment and other services, but it's all coming through a girls' school. So it sort of has two effects. One is, I think Kennedy always said that he felt like you could get the greatest impact if you invested in girls and you invested early from the very beginning. And so I think the school itself is creating this next generation of leaders. Um, the impact of connecting a school to social services makes that even go even further in the community because everyone sees that they're getting all these other things that they want and need, like clean water, through a girls' school. And so girls and women sort of ultimately like are kind of um, their value increases. And there's just been so much research that shows that. If well, one, if girls are more likely to get educated, but also just in communities where women are more valued, under five mortality drops significantly, income increases, HIV transmission goes down. Um, there's just huge kind of ripple effects, yeah. I think, from investing in, in girls and women. Kennedy, could you say a little bit about what kinds of social services you decided to connect to the school? The school became the center. So whereby we have, right now we have a health clinic. And they also became part of my experience, like seeing people where people dying in the slum with no health care. So I was getting in my mind that one day we're going to have a health clinic. We also have a library. 
I am a man who really loves reading. <laughs> so even though I live in a poor life, I used to live in a 10 by 10 room, no chairs, nothing, it's only books and my uh, small carton that I was used to unbox, I used to sleep on, you know what I mean? So, but I used to look for a place to read, I couldn't find, you know what I mean? So I thought like, if we can have a library in the slum, it can be something amazing. Yeah. Because we have to be able to go to the library. So right now we have a library in Kibera, so it's really helping a lot of people. Another thing is we provide water services in the community. We have a 100,000 water liter tank. Yeah. The largest one in Kibera, you know. Uh, yeah, another thing I believe in so strongly is the economic development, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, that's a powerful tool, you know. So right now we, are, we have a group, we have something called Group Saving and Loans. So the community coming together in groups to pull their money together and loan themselves, you know, and the interest rate, just the minimum I interest see. rate, goes back to the group. This also goes, goes back with the Western ideology, which I also learned from Russia. It's interesting. Every time in Kibera, I saw these people coming when they don't have much money, the industries of microfinance. Then the next time they come with huge cars, big cars, and we're like, the money comes from the slum. Mm. So we say, listen guys, why do we need those people? Why can't we just make our own way? <laughs> yeah. So whereby the interest comes back to us. I mean, and I've seen, for example, I've seen a, a woman who really impressed me as now selling a factory of peanut butter from that loan. You know what I mean? And she's now employing more than, more than 10 people. That's you fantastic. Know? What I love to do here yeah, is I I just love being with the shining girls. I have the shining girls for Kibera. We do drama, dancing, and talk about life. With me, I've never got someone to help me like to motivate me so i want to make them see what they can do or discover their talents i want to see them grow to be very talented girls very talented women most of them they go to school very early in the morning, like 5 a.m., and they come back at 7. So, and then I keep them busy on Saturdays too, so they don't find time to go around doing things that will put them to danger, things that will risk their life. So, they never find that time, and that's how I keep them busy. <laughs> yeah, I keep them out of trouble. It is very hard for them to survive around here. Here in Kibera especially, in this our community, there are so many rape cases. And so they, they are not safe. Some of them don't have parents. They stay with relatives and they are being maltreated, but they don't talk. So it's like they keep quiet, but inside they are hurting. We discuss about HIV, pregnancy, and if there's something they can't talk to their parents about, we'll be there, we'll listen to them. They see me as their friend, and I'm glad. Okay, they are scared to tell their parents, but they feel good if they come and tell me. The kind of advice I will give them, they will feel it in their heart. I want them to be enlightened. They should not only live life, they just see Kibera as their home, but they should think beyond Kibera. 
they should have vision. I've grown up in Kibera and I've seen it's not easy. So it's just you. You have to choose the path that you want to take.